morning. morning. It's so good to see each and every one of you. I pray that God has already blessed you. It's going to be, I think, a wonderful day. I know we've got some storm clouds coming and going, and yet we are praying that the Lord will help hold off the rain for us later this afternoon because we have some individuals who are taking a wonderful step today in their faith and following the Lord in baptism. So we are looking forward to that. But as we get started, will you uh, pray with me? Father in heaven, as we come before you, Lord, we love you. Father, we, Lord, I pray, are, are humbled by the wonderful privilege we have to not only call you Father, Lord, to serve you. Lord, for you to take our lives and use them for your glory and honor. Lord, we praise you for that privilege. Lord, I ask that you would bless our time here this morning. Lord, bless every aspect of our service so that we might glorify and honor you today. Father, as we praise you. Lord, as we fellowship with one another. Lord, as we dig into your word. May you bless it all. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Um, let's see. It is the first Sunday of the month. And I know I've got at least one, because there's one in my family, but do we have any August birthdays? Would you please stand up?
may be seated. Starting this month, we're going to handle missionary moment a little bit different. Instead of having a different missionary every week, we're going to focus on one missionary a month so we can really get to know them. And during that time, um, we're going to give you as much information as we can about them. And then at the end of the month, we're going to take up a love offering for them. So for the next two weeks, we'll be collecting a love offering for the missionary of the month. The missionary of the month is actually Judy Bowen with ABWE Print Shop in Togo, West Africa. And she's going to be here the fourth Sunday in August. So we're going to try to get that collected so that when we give her the Bible school offering, we can also give her the love offering. So I'm going to start with a little bit of background about Togo. Um, you know how sometimes people that live in Michigan, they show you the hand to tell you where they live. Well, I'm going to show you the hand for Togo. So it's upside down. And this is the country of Africa. The Sahara Desert would be up here. And this is the shape. Togo is located right about here. It's a really, really narrow country. It's actually smaller slightly than the state of West Virginia. It has an average annual income of $830 a year. So you, that kind of tells you something right there. The official language is French, but they also have national languages. The two main ones are Eve and Kabie, but there are actually more than 40 languages spoken in that tiny little country. And voodoo has a really strong presence in that area of Africa as well. ABWE has two locations in Togo. One is the southern location, and then they have one in the north. For a small country like that to have two different locations, that's pretty impactful. Judy actually works out of the southern location, and they have a lot of ministries at ABWE in Togo South. They have women's ministry, uh -huh. Christian schools, planting churches. They have several health services there. The hospital takes up most of the space on that main compound. They have a mobile clinic. They have community health services. They also train nurses. They have a lot of volunteer doctors and nurses that come there. Um, Ariel Spencer actually went there for a missions <coughs> trip there and worked in the ministry in the hospital there. Um, when we were there, there's a long line. People come hours before it even opens and start, start lining up for the health services that they offer at the hospital. The print shop was established in 1994 on that same compound as the hospital is. They provide tracts and booklets and Bibles, songbooks, Sunday school materials, Christian school materials, and they also translate a lot of those materials. They translate Bibles. Um, if you remember, some of the updates that I gave had to do with their problems that they had with translation. And in the last, the last update I did for Judy, you remember they purchased some materials from Canada that got lost in transit. So that's what they do sometimes too. Sometimes they, they buy them from other places and ship them in. The main focus of all of the ministries there on that compound, whether it be the health ministry or the print shop ministry or women's ministries, they're all focused on evangelism. Leading people to Christ is their main goal. Um, in the print shop, they also have audio-visual resources and a radio ministry, and some of the bookstore literature is purchased from other places like Togo, Canada, the U.S., the Ivory Coast, Europe. Some is written by Togolese nationals. Some is acquired and then translated into all of those different languages that they have in Togo to offer it to them at a very low cost. They try to get it to them with the lowest cost possible. Judy's been at the print shop for about 30 years. She runs the print shop along with six Togolese employees. Um, 17 years ago, I had 17 years ago, I had the opportunity to go to Togo, West Africa on a missions trip with Wes and Amy Sigler, along with Jared and Nicole and Andy and my two kids, and it was an amazing experience. Troy Gaff went at a different occasion with Wes Sigler, so this is something that's really dear to our hearts. Um, Komise and Edward and Maggie, which were three of the people that worked there when we went there, they're still employed there. And um, I put some pictures back there that I got from their website that show the employees that show some different things about the print shop. But I also stuck some of our mission strip pictures up there. So you're going to see a younger version, a much younger version of all of us. But it just kind of gives you an idea of, of what it's like there and the people there. So. 
I also put back on the table little cards that have the mailing address to Judy and Togo. It has her email address, and then it also has the website of one of another ministry that I'm going to talk about next week that she has. But that information, you're welcome to take one of them so that you can contact her. She's actually in the States now because she's going to be here the fourth week. But um, I think she goes back in October, I think, is when she goes. And if you, <laughs> probably if you get one of those and you mail her a card now, she might get it in October. I don't know, but it takes a while. So just to keep you updated, I'll, I'll be here next Sunday, too, telling you more about her photography ministry and reminding that we are going to have a love offering for her for the next couple of weeks. And aside from Judy, I had a message from Tim Woodring um, asking for prayer for him. This past week, he's been having some major heart problems. The doctor told him that his heart is in really bad shape. It is beating over 200 beats a minute, and they can't seem to get it down. He's on several medications. He's seen several specialists this past week, and he just asked that we pray for him while they try to figure out what's going on. Sure, the math on that was right 17 years ago. I was like six then. So. <laughs> Man, all right. So yeah, I'll, I'll be getting older next week. Next week. Yeah. Hitting that uh, big four zero. So catching up with some of you guys. All right. So let's take a look at our whole events for the events of the week. Our first event of the week is actually going to be today. We have our baptism at three o'clock at the bottom of the pond. Um, Looks like rain stuff's going to hold off, so hopefully you can uh, meet us there. We'll have a good time of fellowship and helping to uh, celebrate uh, those people who are making that decision uh, to make their love of Christ uh, public. Uh, other events of the week, we have our prayer meeting on Wednesday and then men's Bible study on Thursday. Uh, and that's also marked on there. It's a reminder that Judy will be with us on the 27th of this month. So uh, Next week on Sunday is the family night for small group. So if you haven't joined yet, that would be your last opportunity for December to kind of see how that goes. Uh, so please, if you are uh, wanting to attend a small group, uh, see Pastor, we'll get a location for you. Um, it's been a great time so far this summer being able to fellowship with uh, friends from the church. So if you're available, make yourselves available next Sunday. Um, as far as other prayers, do be praying for the teachers and students as they head back to school. Um, it seems like it's really early this year. But uh, some of us will be out before Memorial again, so that'll be nice. Uh, as far as our prayer concerns, uh, do be in prayer for Sonny and Laura on the passing of uh, uh, Sonny's brother and all David, um, as well as our other concerns on there. Uh, just make sure you continue to pray for the people on our prayer list. Um, prayer is powerful. Um, so as we're doing that corporately, that will um, definitely make a difference. So. Uh, everyone who is on there um, received some grace this week. Uh, is there any other announcements we need to add? All right, thank you. you got your Bibles. Would you go with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 8? And as you're turning there, um, I know some have asked, and I know Rich is a better person to ask than I am, but um, I did get to go see Jeannie this week, and she wants to convey her appreciation for all your prayers and thoughts and concerns, and hopefully, with no need for surgery, and following the doctor's orders, in a couple of months, she'll be back to normal. So, but do keep her in prayer um, as she heals, and then, as Jared mentioned, please keep the O'Neill family, that's um, Sonny's sister and, and uh, the brother-in-law that passed away, just keep them in your prayers. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 is where we're at this morning. Starting in verse 1, Scripture says, Who is like the wise man? And who knows the interpretation of the matter? A man's wisdom illumines him and causes his stern face to be. I say, keep the command of the king because of the oath before God. Do not be in a hurry to leave him. Do not join in an evil matter, for he will do whatever he pleases. Since the word of the king is authoritative, who will say to him, what are you doing? He who keeps a royal command experiences no trouble, for a wise heart knows the proper time and procedure. For there is a proper time and procedure for every delight. 
Though a man's trouble is heavy upon him, if no one knows what will happen, who can tell him when it will happen? No man has authority to restrain the wind with the wind, or authority over the day of death, and there is no discharge in the time of war, and evil will not deliver those who practice it. All this I have seen and applied my mind to every deed that has been done under the sun, wherein a man has exercised authority over another man to his hurt. So then, I have seen the wicked buried, those who used to go in and out from the holy place, and they are soon forgotten in the city where they did this. This too is futility, because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly. Therefore the hearts of the sons of men among them are given fully to do evil. Although a sinner does evil a hundred times and may lengthen his life, still I know that it will be well for those who fear God, who fear him openly. But it will not be well for the evil man, and he will not lengthen his days like a shadow, because he does not fear God. There is futility which is done on earth. That is, there are righteous men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked. On the other hand, there are evil men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I say that this too is futility. So I commended pleasure, for there is nothing good for a man under the sun except to eat and to drink and to be merry, and this will stand by him in his toils throughout the days of his life, which God has given him under the sun. When I gave my heart to know wisdom and to see the task which has been done on the earth, even though one should never sleep day or, day or night, and I saw every work of God, I concluded that man cannot discover the work which has been done under the sun, even though man should seek laboriously he will not discover. And though the wise men should say, I know, he cannot discover. You know, the key with all that is doing it our way, doing it on our own. Solomon used up the majority of his life trying to do it man's ways. He took the wisdom God blessed him with and he didn't use it very wisely. But folks, the wisest thing that we can do is give our lives to God and seek his ways. I'm not going to ever say that following Christ is easy. But folks, for those who know the Lord and fear Him, something Solomon mentions there, you'll never be ready. And I can promise that. Would you stand with me as we sing? Hear the call of the kingdom.
before the throne of God above.
Not always true, though, is it? You know, does anyone know where it started? The two men I have pictures up here are of actually Marshall Field and George Watermaker. Two men who started two very large retail stores. Watermakers was in Philadelphia, Marshall Fields in Chicago. But the idea, the customer's always right, he, it was preached by the owner to his employees, and it was to instruct those employees to go above and beyond for the sake of the customer. It's a nice notion. And as it picked up steam, especially in blue-collar communities, it created a loving respect and devotion to those stores. There were some who would go shop at these stores, even if they knew they were going to pay more, because they knew the service they were going to get. Sadly, that attitude has kind of dissolved away. And it's gone from devotion, really, to an entitled atmosphere. Now, I have to ask, my wife and I debate a little bit, how many of you don't know who that's a picture of? Okay, for those of you who don't, then you probably haven't seen the original Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. She was the biggest spoiled brat of the kids that were up there. But isn't it true that we live in a world today where devotion and respect for hard work and good service has turned into a sense of entitlement? I deserve this. I deserve this. It's my way. You talk about laziness. And then sadly, it's become an entitled attitude even among workers that we, we live in a day and age. And, and I know there are still good employees out there. I'm not saying this is a blanket statement. But we're seeing more and more of this attitude even from people who come to work that actually look at their bosses like, you should just be glad that I showed up today. <laughs> Folks, that is not the attitude that Christ has called us to, is it? He's called us to something more, to something higher and greater. You know, I want to share this morning two examples of bad service attitudes and bad servants, followed by a good one. So if you've got your Bibles, would you go with me to 2 Kings chapter 4? 2 Kings chapter 4. The first one, if you're not already familiar with this story, is the story of Naaman. Naaman wasn't a Jew. In fact, he was the commander of a foreign army. And he came to Israel because he had a great problem. And how he was treated is incredible, but even the servant within his own home is important to note. Second Kings chapter 4. I'm sorry. I wrote down 4 and I meant 5. I apologize. 2 Kings chapter 5, starting at verse 1. Now Naaman, captain of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man with his master, and highly respected because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man was also a valiant warrior, warrior, but he was a leper. Now the Arameans had gone out in bands and had taken captive a little girl from the land of Israel, and she waited on Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, I wish that my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria. Then he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus spoke the girl who is from the land of Israel. Here is a girl who had been taken captive, and she's serving as like a, a handmaid to Naaman's wife. And here this is this great captain doing a, a very successful for his king. And he develops leprosy. And here this little girl, you know, if, if, if any of you ladies had been taken captive as a, as a young girl, pre-teen even, and you were serving as a handmaid to some other woman taken from your home, how likely are you to be concerned with doing the best job possible for that lady? Or maybe upset, brokenhearted, maybe even angry or bitter that you're not in your own home with your mom, and yet she sees her master's leprosy and tells his wife, you know, if we were back home in Samaria where I come from, there's a man who could fix this, who could heal him. 
So David gets word, and he goes and tells the king. Sure enough, the king says, hey, if there's somebody who can cure you, by all means, go get cured. But if you know the story of Naaman, he gets there, and <laughs> let's pick up in verse 9. So Naaman came with his horses and his chariots and stood at the doorway of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger to him. Elisha himself doesn't even come out. Now, most of you are probably familiar with the name Elijah. There's Elijah and Elisha, two great prophets who were used by God. But Elisha stays and says, hey, uh, he's like, go find out what this guy wants. Sends a messenger to him, and then look at what it says there. Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh will be restored to you, and you will be clean. Now, if you don't know much about the geography and layout and, and some of the settings of the Jordan River, Maybe I can put it in terms you might understand. How many of you have been to Chicago before? Okay, we have the Chicago River. Flows comes right through downtown. And some people think, man, they love St. Patty's Day because they dye it green every year for St. Patrick's Day. And it just stays green all year long. There's a reason for that. I went, um, oh man. Probably been almost 14, 15 years ago. Maybe, well, maybe. 13, 12, somewhere in that area, between 10 to 15 years ago, when I was teaching, um, I think it was our last year, the last little year we had teaching together, my wife actually got bumped from preschool up to fifth grade unexpectedly, and I had sixth grade, so we did a joint field trip, and we took our kids downtown, and there's a tour boat you can take that goes up the Chicago River, and it sees some of the uh, skyscrapers and whatnot. And the funny thing is, I've never been on that tour in my whole life. And I actually learned things about Chicago, even growing up there, that I didn't know. But one of the things that the tour guide mentions is, please do not stick your hands in the water, and please do not eat fish from this river, or eat the fish that you get out of this river, because this river is classified, it's just been upgraded, he said, within the last 20 years, from extremely toxic to just deadly. And I was like, what? Wow, that sounds great. <laughs> So if you ever in Chicago and you happen to you know stop at maybe one of those restaurants that's right there on the river and they're pulling fish out of the river, go to a different restaurant. But it was disgusting. I mean, it is that water is nasty looking. You, uh, I would almost bet if you scoop it up, it would be almost as green as Jared's shirt. I mean, it's nasty. How many of you then, if you know a river's that nasty and any fish that might be in it are probably mutant type fish? How many of you would want to go bathe in that river? I don't see no hands. Why not? You say, because even if I'm in an area where my water is a little rusty, that's still better than toxic green. Amen? The Jordan River may not have been as toxic as the Chicago River is, but the Jordan River was a nasty, dirty river. And here comes Haman, all the way, travels to come see this guy, and he doesn't, the guy he's coming to see doesn't even come to the door. His servant comes to the door and he says, well, my master says you need to go to the Jordan River and go dip in it seven times. Now, imagine you're this man of military might. You want me to do what? As it turns out, he gets furious. He says, surely there's other rivers that I can go dip in. But as Elisha says, we're no, you have to go into this one. He finally concedes, especially when one of his servants says, you know, if he were to ask you to go defeat some great army, you'd do it in a heartbeat, wouldn't you, Naaman? Well, yeah. He says, then, what is it to go dip in the dirty river seven times if it heals you? The Lord convicts his heart to a point where he finally goes, he dips in that river seven times, and sure enough, when he came up that seventh time, now i got to imagine, the first time going in the water, it doesn't look any better. Second time, third time, fourth time, looking at his hands, maybe looking at his body and his legs. It's like nothing's changing. But then on that seventh time, as he came up out of that water, the Bible says he was clean. Now, Naaman's not the point of the story, and Elisha's not the point of the story. Because Naaman, as he gets up and he sees that he's been healed, he goes back to Elisha and says, Surely, let me give you. I've brought gold, I've brought these clothes, all this money. Let me give you, let me pay you for healing me. And Elisha says, no. I haven't even given you it was God. Elisha doesn't want people to then get this idea that, oh, just come to Israel and you can pay to be healed. He says, no, God has chosen for some reason to spare your life and to heal you from this. Now here's where the bad servant comes in. 
Gehazi. And what's interesting is Gehazi actually got to see something even equally, if not more miraculous. Because it was when an army had come and surrounded him. And Gehazi went in and was terrified. Master, what are we going to do? <laughs> By the time Elijah was like, Lord, can you touch his eyes and let him see? Elijah went out and he saw there was a host of heavens serving as a buffer protecting them. Then he gets in there. And Gehazi got focused on all those goods that made him run. And even though Elijah had said, no, we're not going to take them. Gehazi then waits until Naaman starts heading home and then he follows after him. And Naaman gets into his eyes, you know, but, but we've done such a great service. So in verse 20 he says, but you know, my master has spared Naaman, so he ought to pay for something. Wait a minute here. Gehazi didn't go on God's behalf, or go on behalf to God and say, God, will you heal this man? He was just communicating a message and yet he got in his Mind. No, 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 no. We should, we should take some of that. Even to the point that he lies and says, well, well, there's these young men that have come in, Naaman, chase after man. You know, I know we're not supposed to, but you know, if, if we could actually take some of that now, because it would help us that we could take care of this man, then what does he do? He goes and hides it, and then he shows back up. Elisha says, okay, he's like, what have you done? Well, what are you talking about, Master? When we take off of who we are called to serve, we've got a problem. Because then we can easily, and we see it everywhere in our world today, we can justify any action for what suits our needs. But that's not the kind of service that God has called us to. He wants us to serve as though we're serving Him. And Gehazi took his eyes off, and he disobeyed, he lied, and you know what happened? God gave him the leprosy that he took away from him. You know, the keys to Gehazi's justification were pride and greed. And those things have and always will exist in the works of men. But we have been called to a higher standard. We're, we're not to serve for what we're going to get out of it. You know, it, sin, that kind of living is always going to end up costing us more than we're willing to pay. We're not to serve based on what we think we deserve. We're to serve for God's glory. Go with me now to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. It's amazing, but several of us here probably can think of some Gehazi's that we've worked with. Hopefully, that attitude hasn't found a way into our hearts, but that doesn't mean it's not possible, folks. Something we're to be on guard against. But then you come to Matthew chapter 20. And the other problem in serving from an attitude of pride or greed is then serving and being dissatisfied. There is great satisfaction that comes from serving the Lord. And that should be more than enough for us. Yes, God blesses us with many things, but the fact that He's allowing us to serve, that should be more than sufficient. Look at what verses 1-7 through seven say. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. When he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius for the day, he agreed with them. They agreed to it. He sent them into the vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to those he said, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. And he went out about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing around and he said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day long? They said to him, because no one hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. Here you've got a master who comes out, he owns a vineyard and says, I need to hire some people to do some work. It's harvest time. So he goes out and he finds some men and says, look, I'll give you a denarius for the day. Will you work for me all day long? Denarius a day? Seems a little bit generous. He's like, absolutely, we'll take it. But he goes out a couple hours later and sees there's still workers out there and they've got a lot to do. The harvest 
is plenteous. He could use some more labor. He said he found some more men. Says, "Hey, you guys want a job? I'll do right by you. Just go out to my vineyard and start working." And, and the sixth hour, the ninth hour, he goes out there, and even the eleventh hour, he goes out and says, "Will you come and work for me?" Now, look what verse eight says. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to the to his foreman, "Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group." To the first. So you start with that group that was just here for the last hour, you pay them first, and then go on and save those who've been working all day for last. When those hired about the eleventh hour came, each one received a denarius. When those hired first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they grumbled at the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you've made them equal to us who've borne the burden and the scorching heat of the day. But he answered and said to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what's yours and go. But I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? So the last shall be first and the first last. Come back again to a wrong view of service. Look what I did. I've been working for you all along. i got a question for you. What did you mean? Now, th th I'm asking this to each and every one of you. What did you mean in your heart when you first came to Christ and said, Lord, will you please forgive me? And I'm worthy of sinner. Did you really mean when you asked him to be Lord of your life. Well, hopefully every one of you would say, of course I did. I understood my position as a sinner, and I understood I needed a Savior. And I cried out for him to save me. I wanted Jesus Christ to be Lord of my life. You know what it means for him to be Lord of your life? That means he has ultimate say in what you do and how you do it. How do you serve him? I mean, if you were Christ, what would you expect from those who claim your sacrifice on the cross? I don't like putting it that way, but I need to ask myself what I'm doing for Christ. And why? I tend to believe we all need those hard questions asked from time to time so that we can ident identify any failures or shortcomings in our life in order that we might correctly serve him. Serve him with the right attitude. Go with me back to Colossians chapter 3. In our text, starting in verse 2, there's some important things that Paul says. First off, he says, slaves. <laughs> Why does he call us slaves? I mean, that's such a derogatory word. But we call him master, don't we? Now, wait a minute here. What makes Jesus your master? Why, why do we call him master and not just Jesus or just God? Why do we call him master? Well, how about the fact that he paid for your sins with his own blood? And because he paid for them, you belong to him. Because he paid the price you couldn't pay. By all accounts, we belong to Christ. It's exactly why Paul called himself a prisoner of Christ, even, even when we were even while he was physically a prisoner of Rome, he said, I'm a prisoner of Christ. Because it doesn't matter what my circumstances here are in this world, I belong to Jesus. And I'd rather identify with him than anything else. Their identification. It's such an important part of what we hope to celebrate later this afternoon. We've got a couple of young girls, a couple of young ladies, even a young adult. I've had a chance to sit with each and every one of them and explain what baptism isn't about. Me dunking you under the water. I mean, I can do that in a swimming pool and we can have a lot of fun, but baptism is your way of obeying Christ. But it's your way of identifying with him and saying, I belong to Jesus Christ. 
And we only can say that because he paid for our lives. He paid a price. It's far greater than he should have paid. But he did it out of love. We belong to Christ. So Paul calls us slaves. And then what does he say? In all things. Those words are important and significant. Because they close the door for debate. No matter what it is we do, if we are his slaves, then in all, not just some, not most, but in all things, we are to obey those who are your masters on earth. So, who does that include? Anyone in a position of authority in your life, you are to obey in all things. Not based on opinions of them, you are to submissively obey. And God explains the why, but he leaves no room to argue or debate our measure of obedience. In all things obey. And then he says, not with external service, as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Ouch. Wait a minute here, God. We, you're mandating full obedience and everything to those who are in authority over us, but now you're adding that we have to do it with the right attitude? He doesn't want us to just please them. He wants us to fear God in how we serve. And not just how we serve him, but how we serve in every capacity. Don't just obey on the outside. Obey on the inside. Want to have a desire to obey and do a good job. Oh, but wait, there's more. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than men. So always obey in all things with sincerity and now heartily or joyfully. I'm supposed to joyfully do my job or serve anyone because I'm supposed to be doing it even though Mr. Such and Such is my boss at work. I ought to do my work and serve my boss as though Jesus was the boss. Obey him in all things. Do it sincerely. Heartily and joyfully. I'm going to do my job with the right attitude. Because I'm not doing it just for men. I'm doing it for my Lord and Savior. But you know what might just happen along the way? What happens if your boss or some of your co-workers are not saved? Because I'd be willing to bet that many here today would have to say, yes, most of the people I work with are not saved. What happens when God takes your attitude of complete obedience in all things, doing it sincerely, doing it joyfully unto the Lord. What happens when God takes that and uses it in their lives? Oh, but, you know, Pastor, those, those situations, you know, those are nice feel good stories, but they don't happen every day. Maybe it's because we're not obeying the right way every day. This isn't a do it on Mondays or do it on Sundays in all things all the time. You serve as though Jesus is the one you're answering to in how you do your job. Now granted, I want to please my boss because I want to do a good job. Because I want him to see it that I'm not just trying to kiss his butt. I'm trying to show him that I serve the right way because of who my God is. Because of what he's done in my life. I want that to be visible to all who see. Hmm. There are those who have said and probably even thought, you know, God, this is too much. You don't know my boss. He doesn't deserve me serving him that way. Or, why should I bother? You know what God would say? He doesn't deserve it? That's absolutely true. Your boss doesn't deserve for you to serve in that capacity. But you don't deserve me. That's when the head drops in recognition of our own unworthiness. But God, who is rich in mercy and grace, says don't do it based on their deserving it. Do it because you love me. Do it because you realize what I've done in your life. 
and you want to please and glorify me with your life, let that be your reason for obeying in all things, sincerely and heartily and joyfully. You do love him, don't you? See, what goes through your heart and mind, I wonder, when God places his hand on your heart and says, I love you. Hopefully you have some of those moments <laughs> where you stop. Whether it's in that precious quiet time with the Lord in the morning, whether it's how he chooses to handle certain situations in our life, but he has those moments where he just kind of grabs our heart and says, hey, I hope you know I love you. And believe me, as wonderful as it is when my wife says it to me, as much as I love it when some of my when my kids come up and say it to me, or other people that I love, when they say those words to me, they're precious. But man, when God gets a hold of my heart, he says, hey, I love you. That's our response to him. Hopefully it's that. <laughs> if there's any built-up crust there that it just kind of breaks its head and says, Lord, oh, whatever you want. I love you too. If we have the desire to serve him with that, Lord, whatever you want, I'll do it. That's what he wants. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. Look, God's already promised me not only the inheritance of the adoption of sons, but God's going to reward me and take care of me. If I do what's right and I lose my job, God, God hasn't lost any power. He hasn't lost any control. If my dependence is on how I'm going to provide and how I'm going to do it and whatnot, well, I've got a big problem. But if it's like, you know what, Lord? The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Lord, if you choose to take these things out of my life, I know you still love me. I know you still have me safe in your hands. I'm going to trust you, Father. Of course, Paul gives the warning in that last verse where he says, For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. Don't think for one second. Boy, I, I, I know I've shared this before, but as much as growing up, I, I was taught, and I mean, very forcefully taught, to always respect authority in my life. Especially all the adults that I am, you know. Whether it didn't matter if it was my teacher at school or it was just someone else in my church, I always respected authority. People who serve, policemen, firemen, all those, you treat them with respect. You show respect to them because they have authority. I was taught that, but you know what? I wasn't afraid of anyone else but my dad. Why? Because my dad was the one who corrected me when I was wrong. And I had to help the fear of him. Now, thankfully, it was hard sometimes with some of the weapons I got to believe it, but most of them I knew. Especially as I got older, I realized the correction he gave was because he loved me. Folks, whether it's a healthy fear of your physical dad or not, or it's someone else in your life, who is the number one person we should have a healthy fear of? It's the one and only God, amen? Therefore, don't think for one second that you can live your life anyway, or even serve however you want to, and that he'll just ignore it and sweep it under the rug. God doesn't act that way. And believe me, even though you may not feel some of the immediate consequences when you've done wrong, pray for mercy. Ask forgiveness and get it right because you know what? You don't want the consequences that he may have to be allowed. I did say I had one good example. If you take your Bibles and go to Joshua chapter 14 while you're turning there, the last verse here in our text is just the opposite or the reverse side of what God is saying and how we serve. If you just so happen to be someone who is in a position where you have those you have authority over, then you better be the kind of master that Jesus is to you. He says in verse 1, Masters, grant to your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. So as much as you serve, make sure that if you do have those over you, be a Jesus kind of boss. Be a Jesus kind of supervisor over them. It doesn't mean that you can't expect them to do their jobs. Treat them with justice and fairness. But let them see Jesus Christ in how you work and as much as how you lead. But Joshua chapter 14. 
If I could give one encouragement, I know there's plenty of good examples we could go to, but Joshua 14 gives us an example of what type of attitude we're to have as a servant. For sake of time, I'm going to paraphrase and, and summarize the story a little bit quickly. Y'all remember when the Israelites came out of Egypt, they come into the Promised Land, came to one point where Moses sent out 12 men and said, hey, I want you to go check out the land for us. Now, test who knows their Sunday school Bible songs. What does that mean? How many fingers? Ten. Thumbs down means bad. Two fingers. Thumbs up means good. Ten were bad and two were good. Because out of those twelve men that God sent in, ten of them came back and said, Oh, the land's filled with giants. There's no way. If we try to fight these people, they're going to squash us like bugs. And the two who were good, Joshua and Caleb, come back, and they're toting like this big old like branch or a two-by-four almost looking thing with these clusters of grapes that they couldn't carry. One cluster with one man. They had to put it on a pole and carry it and says, what are you talking about? Do you see how incredible the produce is from this land? Not to mention, Caleb stands up and says, God said we could take the land. What are we afraid of? But because they were, the people listened to the ten and didn't listen to the two, God sent them wandering in the wilderness for many more years. As a result, God raised up Joshua to become a great leader in the land of Israel. Joshua wasn't perfect, but he is probably one of the best examples of what being a leader is like. I tell you what, if you are in a position as a supervisor or a boss, or you have a position of authority over anybody in the line of work you do, study Joshua's life. Learn from the couple of mistakes that Scripture gives us of him, but look at how he led. The examples that he learned from Moses and take and apply. God used him in a great way, but then there's this man named Caleb. One of the rewards that God had for him was jo or Caleb was actually given a portion of land when the land was being divided up amongst the 12 tribes. Now, can you imagine what Caleb chose for his portion of land? Does anybody know? He says, I want that mountain where the Anakim were. In Joshua chapter 14, would you go to verse 10 with me? And I promise, I'm closing quick here. Starting in verse 10, Joshua 14, the Bible says, Now behold, the Lord has let me live, just as he spoke these 45 years, from the time that the Lord spoke the, this word to Moses, when Israel walked in the wilderness, and now behold, I am 85 years old today, I am still as strong today as I was on the day Moses sent me, as my strength was then, so my strength is now, for war and for going out and coming in. Now then, give me this hill country about which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day that Anakim were there with great fortified cities. Perhaps the Lord will be with me and I will drive them out as the Lord has spoken. So Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, for an inheritance. Therefore, Hebron became the inheritance of Caleb. Because he followed the Lord God of Israel fully. Do you know what the Anakim were? They were giants. When the Israel, when Israel was being divided into lots, and Judah was given his portion of land, and Reuben was given his portion of land, and Dan was given his portion, and on and on and on, they divided it all up. And said, Caleb, you can pick whatever you want. But each of you, when you go into this land, you find everyone who lives there and you kick them out. You kick them out of the land because this is the land that I've given to you. And the main reason God wanted to, them to evict anyone who lived in that land wasn't to be harsh or mean to them. It was, I want them out because I don't want their wicked, sinful practices to become part of your life. You know where Israel had some of the biggest problems? is all the people they didn't evict. And because they didn't fully obey, many of those came in to bite them in the blood. Where Caleb went, he said, you give me that land where all them giants are. I'm just as strong. I'm 85. I'm going to be at 85 years old. I'm going to say, okay, I'll take care of a bunch of giants. I'll go whoop them by myself if I have to. And he wasn't bragging on how strong he was. He wasn't saying, man, I've been using my bow flex and I'm still in the No, he says, no, God has promised this victory and I'm claiming it. I'm going to follow him and I'm going to serve him. And God blessed him too mad. Folks, the attitude Paul's talking about us, for us here, 
We're all called to serve. And it doesn't matter how old we are. He's called all of us to serve. Quite frankly, those of you in this room today, maybe some who are here today that are part of this church that serve as teachers, you're in my prayers this week. We have some just entering the field. We've got some who have been doing it for a while, but you are in my prayers. And I pray that this school year, God uses each and every one of you in the lives of your students in an incredible way. And whether you're serving in a public school or a Christian school, it doesn't matter. Serve those kids. Like Jesus will do. For those of you who maybe have jobs that from time to time they're just wear on you and grind on you, maybe you have a boss who's just ridiculous or impossible to work with. Don't serve. Don't serve him. Serve him. You serve as though Jesus is your boss. God bless you for it, you man. How we serve makes all the difference. Keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Father in heaven, we love you. And Lord, everyone here, there's no one that can make an argument. just how great you have loved us. So therefore, there is no reason, Father, not to serve you with all our hearts. Lord, I believe there are some today that in their lives already you've used them in a great mighty way in how they've served. Because they understand what you're saying here in your word. To do it as though they're doing it unto you. And God, I pray you continue to bless. But Father, we're some may need to work on that more. Lord, I pray that they would determine and choose to serve you in all that they do, even in their jobs. But Father, I pray that as they choose to follow and obey you in that way, that you will use them and bless them for it. Lord, we're looking forward to the day when there is no more service here on this world because it's all done with you and for you, in your presence. Until that day come, May we serve you your way. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me as we close and simple hymn of invitation? As I said earlier, there's nothing greater than when the Lord needs a holy heart and says, Hey, I love you. How do you respond to him? And whenever I sing this song, I always want and try to remember to encourage people. Sing this as though you're praying these words directly to him right now. Let's sing. Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.